The following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. This guy comes to his front door to walk out and get his newspaper. And when he opens the front door, he's totally surprised. He's totally shocked. He sees this little puppy there he's never seen before wagging its tail with his paper in its mouth. And he thinks, I'm loving this new delivery system here. I got to encourage this little puppy. And he runs inside and he gets some treats and he comes back and he's like, good doggy, good doggy, way to go. Gives him a bunch of treats. You know, that was amazing. But the next day he came out, he was horrified. He opened the door and there was the same little puppy there, but there was 12 other newspapers that belonged to the neighbors all sitting out in front. So we spent the rest of his morning trying to give back those papers to the rightful owner. But needless to say, that little puppy was highly encouraged, highly encouraged. And there's something about our lives when we're highly encouraged in our faith what God can do with us, how we can bless other people, all based on our level of encouragement. The opposite is true too. As we go through trials and things in life, setbacks, disruptions, unmet expectations, sometimes we can get really discouraged. You know, I would suggest that it's really a choice which place we stay in But God wants us to be encouraged. In fact, when you look at the words of Jesus walking through, uh, you know, Nazareth and Galilee and uh, walking through Israel, he often walked up to people and says, hey, peace be with you. Walks up to someone else. Hey, be of good cheer. Walks up to somebody else. Hey, let your heart not be troubled. He's saying this over and over again. Why? He's seeing levels of discouragement in people's lives. And he's saying, be encouraged kingdom of God, it's now, it's on. You have a, a, an awesome place in it. And he's trying to encourage people into their God-given place. And yet you and I know we go through seasons in our own life where there are setbacks and discouragement is a reality. And hopefully we don't stay there very long. And if we are, we hope and pray someone loves you enough to come alongside and help encourage you again. And also, turn the other way around. My prayer is that we're the kind of people that we look around and when we see people that are discouraged, to walk up and to speak into their lives. That goes so far. It goes so far when somebody is going through something to speak into their lives. Yesterday, we were at Fry's and I was in there with my three boys and um, we asked the guy for a this tablet, you know, a little tablet. To, it's like, you know, you do your stuff on a little computer tablet, right? So he's telling me about him. And as we're talking, um, he sees my son, Micah, who doesn't really walk in his special wheelchair. And as he's talking, he's dealing with us. We're having a good rapport. Everything's going fine. He's telling me about it. And all of a sudden, he starts <laughs> and busts out bawling, crying. I go, are you okay? He's like, <laughs> My, my nephew, my nephew is just like your son. And he's, he's bawling, crying in the store. And I, I can't console him. And he's like, I'm sorry, you have to have somebody else help you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'm like, wait a minute, no, no. And as he's walking away bawling, all the other employees are all around like, what did you do to him? <laughs> I mean, it literally was, I mean, it, the way this guy was full grown man bawling, crying, it looked like somebody did something horrendous. And really what it was, he's got a sensitive heart. And his heart was breaking. His heart was breaking. When he saw my son, it reminded him of his nephew. And so he's like, you find somebody else to help you. I'm sorry. I said, no, listen, listen, take a minute, please. I, 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 want, to, I, want, to, I want to talk to you. We walked to the side. The employees were walking over like, did you punch him? <laughs> oh, I didn't punch him. I prom- the kids, even my kids were like, daddy's okay, guys, go stay over there. And I realized this guy was so discouraged from the situation, he couldn't keep it together any longer. And I just got to sit and share with him. His name was Emmanuel. I said, Emmanuel, you know what your name means. It means God with us. I know you're going through a trial. I know your family's going through a trial. I can promise you one thing. He will never leave or forsake you. God is with us. He is with you right now. I know you don't get it. You don't feel it. But it's a reality, my friend. And I was able to just put my hands on him and pray for him, encourage him. And I, and I gave him a tag card. 
because he was met with the love of God in a place where he's fallen out in the store. I just want him to know, God loves you. God loves you. And he went from this place of total discouragement. I said, no, take your time, bud. I want, I want you to help us. And so he takes his time. And again, every, all the employees are like, they've never seen a full-grown man ball crying in the middle of helping a customer, and they thought something traumatic happened. And I said, do me a favor. God's given you a sensitive heart. Don't ever lose that heart. Don't ever harden that heart because your heart is sensitive. And this town, this city, this country, the pace, the hamster wheel that we're on will begin to harden your heart if you don't keep it in the right place. I would suggest one of the most important things you and I can do in our life is keep our heart encouraged. Stay encouraged. What does it take for you to stay encouraged? We have to encourage others around us, but we have to stay encouraged because if we get into a place of discouragement and we stay there, it's not long before people pull over and they stop and they don't move on. And I trust that all of us in this room know people who were walking with God in a place of encouragement and along the way, somehow, for some reason, they stopped. Does anybody know folks like that? Okay, I would encourage you right now to think of who those people are because I'm hoping today we wrap up with an action point. And that would be, who do you know that was doing well? There was a time they were doing well. In fact, they were encouraging others. They were running this race. They were living for the glory of God. They were in a good zone. God was using them and their heart was encouraged. But they've been through some stuff. They've hit some speed bumps. They hit some potholes. They were discouraged by circumstance or by people or by unmet expectations or whatever it may be. For some reason, they got discouraged. They didn't get out of that discouragement. They pulled over and to this very day, they're still sidelined. You know people like that? I want to encourage you, write their name down. Because the action point today is going to be for you personally to do what we see in this story here. Today we are going to read the greatest single story of encouragement, I think, anywhere in the Bible. I don't think there's any greater story than in, of encouragement than what we're going to look at today. It's modeled for us in an amazing way. And my prayer is we do the same thing as what we see in the story. And the people you can think of, the people you know, I, I encourage you, I, I implore you to pray for them, pick up the phone and call them, shoot them an email, shoot them a text, maybe today at lunch, whatever it takes. I want you to pray about who those people are. They're in the periphery somewhere. They might not be right in front of you anymore. But I encourage you, shoot them a text. Thinking about you, praying for you. God loves you, has an amazing plan. Love to get together and connect sometime soon when you have a minute. Boom. Would you do that? How many people are willing to do that? Come on, because this to me is where a story like this becomes incarnate. It comes alive. The word is already alive, but I believe when we look at a story like this, if we'll apply it and do what we see in the story, you will be a life giver on a whole nother level. You will give life. And I pray if you and I are in that situation that we see in the story, I pray we have people that love us enough that would do the same for us, don't you? That would do the same for you, that would reach out to you and encourage you and remind you of your God-given identity, your God-given place, his will for your life, that he loves you and that you have friends that love you and will stand with you and help you through things. We were made for community like this. God made us for community. He made us to live in community. And this encouragement is a, is a really big part of it. Um, I love this scripture. Before we jump in, in fact, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Acts chapter 9. That's where we left off last week. Um, but I want to open with this one scripture that I love. It's in the New Living Translations. It's Hebrews 10, 24. And this is what it says. It says, think of ways to encourage one another to outbursts of love and good deeds. Think of ways to encourage one another to outbursts of love and good deeds. Visualize this. You telling somebody, if you have kids, maybe it's your kids or maybe it's a friend or someone in the family, you coming up to them and encouraging them with something that is going to result in an outburst of love and good deeds. Because I believe that's what the Spirit of God wants to do in us. He wants us to be encouraged and there will be an outburst of love and good deeds. I found that God typically uses people like you and I to encourage others to speak into their life. And if anyone's ever done that in your life, you know there can be these outbursts that result because there's a change of heart. 
Instead of our heart being discouraged, we get encouraged. All of a sudden, we feel the fresh wind of God again. Rivers of living water come again, and we begin to be used by God in ways we're in a greater relationship and intimacy with God, and it's, it's really, really amazing. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, encourage one another and build each other up. Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today. But again, my favorite, think of ways to encourage one another to outbursts of love and good deeds. And so as we step into this story today, we're going to pick this up. And the setup is this. Uh, there is a very religious Pharisee by the name of Saul. Uh, he thinks that he's serving God, but he's so disconnected from the heart of God. He's, he has no idea what he's doing. And he is persecuting the believers, the followers of Jesus. He's persecuting them. He wasn't happy with just chasing them down in Jerusalem. He went and got legal papers from the religious leaders so that he can go to the next city and find all the believers that he can, find all the Christians he can, men and women, drag them out, arrest them, and take them back like a herd of cattle, bringing them all the way back to Jerusalem. He thinks he's doing a good thing. Well, God knocks him off his horse, so to speak. <clears throat> he is blinded by the light. Jesus has an encounter and said, Saul, you're, when you're persecuting them, you're persecuting me. I take it very seriously. These are my children. This is my bride. And Saul is like, oh, no, I messed up big time. He had no idea. And God's like, okay, you're going to walk blind for a few days. You're going to do some thinking. I want you to go to a place and wait, and someone's going to meet with you. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next. And Saul is fasting and praying. He's all ears and going, wow, I was so wrong on this faith thing. I was so backwards. So God wakes him up. The biggest opponent of the Christian faith becomes the biggest proponent of the Christian faith. An amazing story. And it moves on in, in verse 9. I want to pick it up in the middle of 19 so we get the, um, the snapshot. It says, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And all of those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. So Saul has the wrong direction. God wakes him up. He's got a new direction. He gets prayed over. He gets healed. And he gets filled with the Spirit. And he hits the ground running. He is highly encouraged. God, that was then. This is now. I get it. I was blind. Now I see. And he is out there and he's serving God. And I'll be honest with you, if you are serving God in any tangible kind of way, if you are allowing God to minister to others through you in any way, shape, or form, you will encounter opposition. Not maybe, you will. You will encounter opposition and Saul hits the ground running and he is just on fire and there's lives changing around him and there are some people who are just like the way Saul used to be and they are not having it. And they want to kill him now. So he's being persecuted. But to understand the snapshot of the story, if you look at verse 23, if you have a pen, you might want to underline, it says, after many days had gone by. And then moving down to verse 26, it says, he came to Jerusalem. Um, these verses here are, are making it sound like the story is just rolling right along. But there's three long years missing from this story right here. And the book of Galatians fills it in. Now, Acts is a chronology of the birth of the church, the growth of the church, and the spreading of the church. And it's covering all the main events, the main things that happen. It can't sit and cover every single year. It doesn't intend to. It does, the author doesn't try to. But Paul, who writes Galatians, it says, let me fill in a gap for you and let me tell you what happened in that time. And this is what he says in Galatians 1.16. This is the history um, he says, after God revealed his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. 
Wow. So Jesus wakes them up to the reality of who Jesus is. He's sharing faith. There's persecution. He gets down from the wall and he's in a basket. But in between these verses, he is saying, I spent three years with Jesus. I spent time with him. And it sounds like he's a little bit on the run. There's people that want to kill him. But in this season, he probably had a lot of figuring out to do. Like, why was I living that way for so long? And why was I so convinced that was the right way to live? And how did I miss Jesus Messiah and the prophecies of who he would be? I totally missed it. And now he's probably going back in his scrolls of the Old Testament and Isaiah and going, of course, here it is right here. I missed it. Psalm 22. Oh, I missed it. And he's finding all these prophecies of Jesus Messiah. And he spends a few years. And here is the, is the deal. Now he is really encouraged. And he is going back to Jerusalem. He's going back to the place where he was sent out on his mission to persecute Christians. Here it is three years later, he's on his way back and he's a changed man. And he probably doesn't know exactly what it's going to be like when he goes back. But he's an encouraged, he's on fire for God and he's like, off to Jerusalem I go. He spent three years in Damascus, sat in out in Arabia and he is highly encouraged and he's coming into the city and this to me is a really unfortunate verse but it's a reality and verse 26 reads like this. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the apostles, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. Wow. He has spent the last three years of his life representing Jesus with a completely changed lifestyle, sharing faith, helping people discover life in Jesus. He's even being persecuted himself. He finally gets back to Jerusalem and gets to where the leaders are. And they're like, yeah, thank you, but no thank you. <laughs> we, we don't really trust you, and we certainly don't want to fellowship with you, so welcome to town, but please don't come in. Ouch. Would that hurt? That would hurt. This is the fellowship. He's showing up. And for right reasons, he used to chase down Christians and kill Christians. Saul killed one of their friends of the early church, Stephen the martyr. He was there. So the guy's got a record, but he's changed. But they're not believing that he's all the way changed. They're still believing in his old record. And this is really discouraging because right now, at this point in the story, he has no future with the apostles. He tries to meet with them, tries to hang out with them. They're like, nope, we don't want to meet with you. We don't trust you. We don't want to know you. And to me, that's really discouraging. If you, were an I, if you and I were in his shoes, we would be highly discouraged at this point. Thinking, wait, that was three years ago. God's doing a new thing. Doesn't he do everything new? Behold, I make all things new, remember? And they're like, yeah, not today. Not with you. We don't really have a space for you, my friend. You just, we don't trust you. We don't know you. And we're not about to start. Wow, how discouraging. Um, and then it moves on in verse 27. And this is where we see an entire story change. An entire story and really somebody's entire future change because of somebody and what they do. Verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. And when the brothers learned about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So enter Saul, uh, excuse me, enter Barnabas. Barnabas is in the situation. We know in Acts 4, his name means son of encouragement. That's the way he's described in the Bible. Luke, who's writing this book of Acts, is saying, everyone that runs into this guy gets encouraged. He has left a trail of, this, of, of encouragement everywhere this guy's gone. There's people along the way that were pulled over and parked and stopped, and Barnabas meets him, and he's encouraging everyone. That's why he's identified when his name first comes up as he's a son of encouragement. He is a son of encouragement. The guy is constantly encouraging, and he can see potential from miles away. Some people don't. Barnabas does. He looks far away and goes... That guy is awesome in God's eyes. That girl has got an amazing future with God. Don't they see it? I see it. God sees it. 
I'm going to go tell him. And not, not everybody operates that way, but Barnabas does. And because of it, he does some amazing, amazing things. I'm going to give you some quick points if you want to be a note taker. Here's four quick things. If you want to be a Barnabas, if you want to be a Barnabas, if you want to be a life changer, if you want God to use you in the way that he uses Barnabas to change lives and to change futures, uh, you might want to jot these down because Barnabas models these things amazingly, and I believe it's the greatest story of encouragement in the Bible. Um, And the first one is this, discern the potential of those around you. Discern the potential of those around you. Spiritually go, God, what do you have for them? What's, What's going on with them, God? And God may say, it's a plan that's a whole lot better than where they're at right now, that's for sure. Even if he gives you that limited disclosure, there's a beautiful place to begin discern the potential of those around you. And I know from Scripture you have the authority to say on this answer that God says, I know the plans I have for you and they're not to harm you, that are prosper to you and give you a hope and a future. And when you see people that are not walking in the hope and future God has for them, then you have biblical authority to say, God's got a lot more for you, my friend. God's got a lot greater things than this. Where you're at right now, mm -mm, it gets way better down this way. So you have the biblical authority to state that. We were made for good works. We were made for intimacy and relationship with God. Uh, So number one, discern the potential of those around you. The second one is this. Don't hold someone's past against them. Don't hold someone's past against them. Uh, You know, we're all sinners saved by grace. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone on planet earth with a pulse has messed up. That's a scriptural reality. Everybody, a spiritual reality. Everybody's messed up in some way, along the way, has messed up. And hopefully come to Jesus and says, will you at least take away my stuff, God? Give me a new beginning. And he says, yes, I'd love to. So who are we really to hold their past against them? And yet in the story, some of that was happening. When you hold someone's past against them, it's hard for them to be encouraged. They may stay discouraged. In fact, don't remind them of their past that way. But even further than that, don't, hold their past against them. In this story, there's a tension. Barnabas, son of encouragement, is like, I'm not holding his past against them, and he's moving forward. But at the same time, the apostle is like, "Mm, I don't think so. Nope, not today. Don't have a spot for him. And so don't hold someone's past against them. God doesn't hold our past against us. Neither should we hold anyone's past against them. Uh, uh, The third point is recognize the calling on people's lives. Recognize the calling Um, Barnabas saw something in Saul going, he was going the wrong way and he was like a loose cannon and he was like an out of control train. But at the same time, there were things in him that tempered by the spirit of God can be the most amazing thing ever. Um, We see this often with the apostle Peter. Peter was the guy like saying the dumbest things at the dumbest time, standing up and speaking up. Everyone else is sitting down and he would say some dumb things. But Jesus is like, you know what? I love his boldness. I love his brutal honesty. I love his willing to just get up and stand up and step out. You know, all the apostles are in a boat and it's out there in a storm and no one would dare get out. Peter's like, looks like Jesus to me. I'm going. I don't know about you guys. It's like, really? Yeah, he's just bold. He's just so bold. And although he denied Jesus three times, Jesus is like, I don't hold that against you either, Peter. I'm going to restore you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you too. And, and you're restored. I'm not holding you past against you. And so there's something to be seen in people and their strengths and their God-given endowments of God's grace and calling and gifts to see in their life. And when you see it, speak to it. Does that make sense? When you see their gift, when you see the grace of God in them in areas, speak to it, point it out, remind them, encourage, because we tend to forget And when we forget, it's easy to get discouraged. So recognize the calling in people's lives. Barnabas goes way out of his way in this area. And he takes somebody who is sidelined, who really has no place in the fellowship yet, and he personally takes them, personally, and says, I know the apostles, I'm going to bring you personally. And Saul's probably like, oh, they already, I already sent somebody up there. They said they don't want to meet me. They don't want to know me. Kind of move on. Barnabas is like, no, it's not going to happen that way. It's not going to end that way. Come with me. I'm going to go up personally. Come on, you're with me. Barnabas puts it all on the line. 
and says, let me tell you guys something. This guy's legit. He's the real deal. The Spirit of God is moving in his life. He's not who he's used to be. God's gotten over it. I've gotten over it. You guys need to get over it too. And the apostles are like, okay, okay. And they let him into the fellowship. And they begin the fellowship together. This story could have ended a really ugly, bad way. And because of Barnabas, he is now in the fellowship. It's pretty amazing. Uh, the fourth one is this, and it seems like uh, Barnabas tends to do this all the time. And I think it's an indicator of an encourager. But the fourth point is to build bridges instead of burning them. Build bridges instead of burning them. People with a gift of encouragement are constantly reaching out and building bridges. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. God bless you. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're encouraging. They're, they're, uh, you know, God's got a plan for you and I'll be praying for you. And, and they, don't, they don't cut people off along the way. They don't start severing relationships along the way. That's kind of a reckless way to live. Just keep chopping off relationships. And some people go through life just chopping up a lot of relationships. Barnabas has got a lot of love. He's got a lot of grace. He extends it. And I believe because he does, God keeps filling him up with more so that he can keep pouring out this amazing encouragement. So in this passage, Saul now is telling the Jews in Jerusalem that Jesus is the Messiah. And there's some tension. The Jews get mad and they want to kill him. And so the apostles, and this is one of the saddest verses, I think, uh, in the Bible. Um, but the, the, it says that the, um, in verse 30, when the brothers learned of this, that Saul was stirring it up, sharing Jesus, but people are getting mad. They get a little stirred up and it says that they essentially took him down to the dock and they sent him. Saul, come with us. Where are we going? Come on, come with us. We're, we're going to the dock. Going to the dock? Yeah, come on, get your stuff. Huh? Come on, they bring him to the dock. What's the boat fare to Tarsus? It's 40 shekels. There you go. Hey, Saul, we'll check in with you, bud. Stirring it up around here. Things are getting a little crazy. See you later, okay? Be in touch. They paid his boat fare and they sent him home to where he comes from. That could be the end of the story. And the sad part about this, when they sent him home, in church history and in the Bible, we have no record of Saul. I think he left highly discouraged, by the way. I, I think he did. I might be wrong. But we have no record anywhere in history or in scripture of Saul doing anything. After the radical transformation that happened and the apostles wouldn't accept him and they finally did. And then after he stirs it up, they send him home and they send him to Tarsus. We have no record, no evidence that Saul was ever contacted by any of the disciples. Maybe they did. There's no record of it. The early church fathers don't have any thing. No one says, well, I was staying in touch with Saul when he was in Tarsus. Nothing. We have no record of any contact with somebody like Saul. And we have no evidence that he continued his ministry back home. We just don't know. I can't say that he didn't. The Bible doesn't say he did no ministry in Tarsus. But we have no record. There's no church planted. We don't have stories of people coming to faith. Nothing. I think the guy's discouraged personally. We have no evidence of any letter being written. We have no evidence that any churches were started in that entire area by him. And I believe he's discouraged because he was basically rejected by the apostles. Barnabas got him included. And they turned around and within 15 days of being in Jerusalem, they shipped him home. 15 days. He was in Arabia for three years getting ready, understanding God more, planning, understanding the kingdom of God coming back to Jerusalem, tries to join. Sorry, we're not having you. Barnabas brings him in. Okay, finally, I'm in fellowship. He's there two weeks. Time for you to go, bud. Grab your bags. Walking you down to the dock. We love you, my friend. Here's the boat fare. Off to Tarsus. Maybe I'm being a little harsh on my reading of it, but that essentially is what happened. And we have no record of anything going on. Why? Because that's what discouragement does to you. That's what discouragement will do to me. When we're discouraged, we by nature kind of pull over and park and we stop. We don't move forward in momentum and in faith. And this is what happens. And, and it looks to me, my read of the scripture 
is that Saul is pulled over and he's discouraged and we've got no record anywhere. I don't know how somebody as contagious as Saul, filled with the Spirit, turning things upside down, I don't know why after this experience there is zero correspondence or evidence of anything going on for years. I don't think there's a good reason for it. I believe it's discouragement. The Bible says that we are to fan each other into flame. Fan. If you're ever building a little fire and it starts going out, air is your friend. Wind is your friend. (laughs) Poof. Fires right back up again. And that's what we're to do with each other's faith is to fan each other into flame. Uh, God wants us, our light to shine before men, not to flicker. I personally think, I personally think my view is that Saul was just flickering up there. And if someone did reach out to him, he'd probably say, just making my tents, my friend. Just making tents up here in, in Tarsus. Just doing my job. Because I think that's what discouragement does. It kind of makes you default back to what you used to do and what you know. And I believe that's the zone he's in. Again, if you know anyone in your life that's pulled over and that is parked and has been sidelined in any way, shape, or form, if this is sounding familiar to someone's life you know, I really pray and encourage you, write down their name. Don't let it go to next week. You'll forget about it. Today, shoot them a text, give them a call, drop them an email, post something, whatever you do, but go after them. Be this kind of person. Be a Barnabas in their life. Now, here's the thing. If you would fast forward just a little bit to Acts 11.22, we need to jump here for this paragraph because this starts to seal the deal in the story. It ties it all together. And there's two people in the story again and again. It's Saul, who I believe is highly discouraged, and Barnabas, who loves to encourage people, who sees potential in everybody all the time, and he's walking around encouraging everyone all the time. And it says starting in verse 22 of Acts 11. The setup is that revival started to break out up in Antioch, north of Jerusalem. And they're like, what? There's revival going on up there? And they go, yeah, let's send Barnabas up there to check it out, see what's going on. So it says, news of this reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged, you might want to underline that, encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts, because that's what an encourager does. In verse 24, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. You might underline look. Look for Saul, and when he found him, underline found, if you're an underliner, (laughs) a highlighter, found him, he brought him, underline brought. He went to look, found, and brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. When we call ourselves Christians, it began right here in the story, this church. It wasn't the church of Jerusalem, Thessalonica, Ephesians. None of these things. It was Antioch. Antioch is the first time they started to use the term Christian. And it was some good 30, 40 years after probably the resurrection or somewhere around there. And so they're Christians. But Barnabas gets there. We see what he does. He encourages everybody. He says, I want you to be encouraged with your whole heart. Know God loves you. Be in with God with your whole heart because he's all in with you. And start to trust him and walk with him. And this whole city is waking up. They're, this whole city is falling in love with Jesus and being encouraged. Barnabas is right in the middle. He sees the potential of the people in Antioch. And then the next thing he does, because he's so amazing, Barnabas is so amazing. He's looking around going, this is great. This, there's revival in the city. People are waking up. They're coming to faith. They're first being called Christians. I'm encouraging them. But you know what? These people need to go deeper. As new believers, they need to go deeper. How are we going to do that? You know what? There's that guy, Saul. And I don't know who's talked to him. And I don't think anyone's written a letter to him. But I heard he's out in Tarsus. And I know God's got a call on his life. I believe God's got a call on his life. I believe God's gifts and calling are irrevocable. The word says that. I believe it. I'm going to go look for him. And I'm not going to stop looking for him until I find him. It's like, really? Yeah, so Church of Antioch, sit tight. God's doing a good thing. I'm going to come back with a friend and he's going to bless you big time. It says in the passage he had to go look for him. 
That means he didn't have an address. I don't think there was correspondence going back. You know, 33 Elm Street. He'd know where he lived. I don't know. He's making tents. Well, there's 20 tent makers in Tarsus. Well, I'll go to each one. Maybe he's in the back tent of the back tent somewhere stitching away. I don't know. I'm going to go to every tent maker I can find in Tarsus till I find Saul because I heard he's out there still and God needs him and God wants him and God's calling him out of the sidelines back into the race because God has a hope and a future and it's not in the back of some room making tents somewhere. It's to bless and give life to many other people. So Saul, Barnabas, goes out of his way and looks for him. I'll go get him and I'll speak life to him and I'll remind him of his calling and I'll remind him that he's included, not excluded. He may feel excluded right now, but God says you're included. You're included, Saul. He goes looking for him. He finds him. And Saul, Saul becomes the apostle Paul. Saul becomes the apostle Paul. And the encouragement that Barnabas gave Saul, now Paul from this point in the story on forward, is going to move forward all throughout the whole Roman Empire, encouraging thousands of people. And you and I today are reading things written by the Apostle Paul through the power of the Holy Spirit that still encourage us today, 2,000 years later. I believe it's because Barnabas. I'm not really sure we would have an Apostle Paul if it wasn't for Barnabas. God's sovereign, but we got to do our part too. We interact with the living God. God does his thing. He doesn't force us. He doesn't put us in a category and jam us into things and make us change our mind or else. We have this free will or agents of free will, but we get to partner with the living, powerful, sovereign God. And when we do, it gets glorious. And Barnabas did exactly that. And Saul did exactly that. And the rest of this gets to be be history. It's really amazing. And so, um, you know, if the worship team comes up, I just want to close on a couple of points about this. I believe one of the greatest ministries you and I could ever have is encouraging people. I really do. I really believe encouragement goes a lot further and deeper and wider than you know. If you're in a marriage, encourage your spouse. It's amazing how many people go through life and just don't encourage, just like they don't have to. Encouragement goes a long way. A little encouragement goes a long way. If you have children, encourage them. If you have friends, you know, school, whatever, on the job, encourage the people around you. Ask God, God, show me something in them that you want to call out. Show me something in them, God, that you want to highlight and call out and bring the light. And Lord, I will speak life to it. The Bible says the power of life and death are in the tongue. You know that? The power of life and death are in the tongue. We can speak life. Speak life to people. Barnabas went around speaking life. Antioch got a call, you got a hope in the future, it's going to get so much better, I'm going to go get Saul, I'll be back, stay tuned guys, the whole church is fired up, and it's all true, he's not making stuff up, he's not psyching them out, he's telling them a, a, a spiritual reality of God's future for him. Um, you know, when, when you look at, say, the sport of boxing, which is really hard, some people are getting hit all the time and getting knocked down and The difference between a good boxer and a great boxer is a great boxer will get back up again. A great boxer will get back up again. And a good boxer won't get back up again. And it's been said by boxers who have got back up again, what made them get up? How did they they find the strength to somehow get up? And oftentimes they'll say, you know what? Sometimes it's just somebody yelling in your corner. Somebody yelling for you in your corner. Come on, you can do this. Get up, it doesn't end this way. Come on. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. We're with you, come on, get up, get up, get up, come on. It's somebody yelling in your corner and I pray we have people yelling in our corner too because there'll be a time where we get knocked down and we need someone yelling in our corner. I think God is asking us this morning, will you yell in somebody's corner? Will you yell in somebody's corner? Will you yell and encourage and and speak life into areas. This is God's calling. You're not making stuff up. We're just trying to partner with God in the areas of what God wants to do. Um, Start yelling in someone's corner. Start speaking life over people. Encourage people in their calling. Encourage, persuade, cheer them, convince them of their true identity, help them see their future because the power of life and death is in the tongue. And so my encouragement is that we will be Barnabases and we will begin to speak life. 
You can even do this today. If you're here today and you go out and get some hospitality, say, thank you so much for doing this. You guys do this every week. It's awesome. On the way out, the sound man, thank you so much for coming and hooking up all this sound and doing this. Thank you. We appreciate it. What a great gift. Your gift blesses everybody else. Mutual edification is happening because of you. Children's ministry, thank you so much for loving up on these little kids and putting the seed of God's word in their heart. Wow, that takes a lot of patience and dedication. Thank you guys so much for what you do. Maybe the teenagers in the coffee house making a latte or a frap for you after the service. Thank you so much for serving God in this way. You're blessing other people. Then you and I begin to speak life and people start going on a whole new level because they're encouraging the things of God. So on that note, let's just uh, close in prayer. Mighty God, um, I just thank you for this passage. I thank you for the power of encouragement when it's done through your word, through the authority of your word. You have God-given identity for people. And there's so many people that are disconnected with their identity. And there's also people that, are, um, that have been chipped and dinged and bruised along the way in our hearts, Lord. And, and our identity gets a little confusing. It gets a little... Uh, we, we don't really understand. We slow down, we pull over, we park. We don't go forward. We don't continue in faith. We don't continue advancing for your glory. We don't continue giving life because we can get a little chipped and dinged and wounded ourselves, discouraged along the way. God, I believe today you want to speak uh, life in that area. Uh, I just want to pray. With, um, if you're dealing with discouragement in any area this morning, I just want to ask you to stand. I just want to pray for you. If you're dealing with discouragement in any way, uh, setback, unmet expectation, prayers, amen. Anybody, let's be real with God right now. There's, this is time for transparency. This isn't in front of anybody else. It's between you and God. Just want to agree with you in prayer. If, you're, if you thought there was a promise that wasn't fulfilled or somebody did things to you, and, and, and you know what? That stuff's real and it does hurt. It stinks, really. Um, but if there's any area of your life that you're discouraged, I just want you to stand up and we want to give this to God. So just put your hands before you. Just in front of you, just make a little cup and just put that idea, that thought, that burden of your heart, that's a real burden. That's something weighing down your soul. That's like putting a 10, 20 pound weight in your hand right there. Take that thing, that unmet expectation, that whatever it is, and just put it in your hand and just say, living God, take this burden from me. Take this burden from me, God. I don't want to walk in discouragement, God. This is weighing me. This is pulling at me. This is tugging me. This is holding me back. This would, if, if it grew any bigger, it would pull me over and I wouldn't even be here today if this continued to grow in my life. Lord God, I just pray, Lord, that you would give me that gift of encouragement that Barnabas had. Replace what's in my hand with a gift of encouragement, God. That you wouldn't only fan me into flame, I would begin fanning others. I would look around looking for opportunities to speak life, to bless people, to encourage others. And Lord, that they would turn around and give life too. Well, God, we love you. Take these things from us, God. Replace discouragement with courage. I know in seasons like this, there's things you're working out that you can only deal with our soul in times of settling down a little bit. But Lord, on the other side, weeping may come for the night, but rejoice cometh in the morning. You said tribulation, you will always have tribulation, but take heart, take heart, take heart, for I have overcome the world. Jesus, you've overcome the world, Lord, and we're overcomers in you. I pray we would take heart and we would take hold of that for which you took hold of us. We love you, mighty God. I pray for a blessing on everyone's week and just an amazing opportunity to connect with people who are discouraged and pulled over and you would use us as prophets God we would leave here functioning in the prophetic that we would speak life into people's life show us what to say show us what to highlight but I pray we would start speaking life and when we need to be spoken into that others around us would do the same we love you mighty God we thank you for everything Lord praise you in Jesus name this has been a presentation, been a presentation of Valley Metro, Valley Church. Metro Church. To hear more messages, to hear more messages, or to support, or to support podcasts, podcasts, please visit, please visit Valley Metro Church. Valley Metro Church. Valley Metro Church. Valley Metro Church. Valley Metro Church.